Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you from these United States of America here in the middle of the country, good old Iowa, where we are We are on Iowa Catholic Radio, and it is so wonderful to have you listening with us, whether you be on uh, the airwaves on Iowa Catholic Radio's radio network, iowacatholicradio.com, where you can listen live, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, and of course, all of our good podcast listeners. Uncommon Good, always brought to you by Mercy College of Health Sciences, which is where Bud and I both work. Down there, I am the Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives and the Director for the uh, Center for Human Flourishing. Bud, what do you do at the old college? An academic dean at Mercy College, so working with our professors to deliver high-quality education to our students. So it is, like I said, brought to you by Mercy College of Health Sciences, mchs.edu. Go check out... All the offerings that are uh, going on, wrapping up summer. I know maybe um, some of the temperatures we've been having lately, it's hard to think that um, just because we're in August, summer's wrapping up. But as my children let me know, quickly wrapping up, uh, getting ready to prepare for the fall semester at uh, Mercy. Um, My guess is if you've not enrolled yet, you're probably not joining us (laughs) for the fall ride but we are always uh, looking forward to people. There's plenty of spring starts and, of course, people starting in the upcoming summer and fall, mchs.edu. Yeah, coming up on fall quickly. I would like to say there's a nip in the air, but I think I jumped the gun on that one. So <laughs> we, we got to wait until September, hopefully. Fingers crossed. We do have but. people who are starting uh, fall football camps recently. I don't know if everybody starts on the same day or not, but I know that um, they're already starting to practice and uh, that's like the, the uh, you know, four plus decades at this point. But when people start practicing for football, to me, summer's basically over already. Well, I'm kind of bitter as a Husker fan with uh, we're playing week zero again. Week zero is so college football would traditionally start around Labor Day. And that was pretty standard. But with the push to have more television viewers like college football has gotten creative about when they run games. So the Huskers, the last like two or three years have played week zero and our first game this year is Thursday night, August 31st. And, uh, it's, it's early. <clears throat> so you usually don't get the football weather, but it's also a game that we've lost every year. <laughs> Are you going to a different country or planet or anything this time? I'm actually going to the game. I'm a glutton for punishment. Oh, so it's not in Ireland uh, this year or whatever. <laughs> uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. So pretty, pretty close. Kind of like Ireland. <laughs> Same similar, um, green lush landscape <laughs> i'm wondering if both uh the irish and the minnesotans would be okay with being mutually paired together like that i think there are irish people who settled in minnesota i would guess it's not like bishop pates mm-hmm. isn't he sort of like the 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 platonic form of like the irish minnesota guy well it's funny in america how cities develop these kind of relationships so like in omaha <clears throat> Kansas City sort of our big brother, and when Omahans really want to have like a bang up weekend, it's like you got to go to Kansas City. You know, like it's got more offerings than than Omaha. Than Oma- well, yeah. Oh man. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> that's like an hour long show on its own. Keep going with your point. Sorry. Professional sports teams and kind of barbecue. <laughs> kind of <laughs> the um they have the um Negro Baseball Hall, Hall of, of Fame, Fame which World is pretty War, cool. World War One Hall of Fame. I, I'm not denying that. Just I prefer going to Omaha. But, so, sorry, Kansas City. No, I there. yeah, sure. And I grew up there, so you know you can visit my birth site. But I, when I moved to Des Moines, I was surprised at how close the connection was was with Minneapolis. Yeah, in my mind, Minneapolis always felt like light years away, but it's really not. We took a John up there a few years ago. No, it, it, it's true. When I got up here, I thought, oh, Kansas City would be where most people would go to, or maybe even Omaha. Um, but yeah, people talk about the twin city quite a bit. So I just think people are like, well, we're Iowa nice. So when it's time to go somewhere, we're going to go where it's even northerner and even nicer. Well, and they have Jeff Cavins and yeah, Jeff Cavins <laughs> gave us the catechetical institute. You and I have both been blessed to 
to teach here in Des Moines at the Catechetical Institute. It's hard to say. Yes. Uh, but uh, you also almost ran over a biker in downtown Minneapolis. That's true. But, like, the bikers are bold up there. Like, we're just going to say that. Like, the pedestrians... They are bold pedestrians. It must be the winners that make them that way. Something else that is bold, bud, I would say chapter nine of our radio radio reading roundup, Augustine's Confessions, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's a, a lot to talk about, of course, but this is the famous Death of Monica chapter. Very important for the entirety of the book. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Wonderful to have you with us, whether it be listening live on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, on iowacatholicradio.com, where you can listen live to all of our shows, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, where you can do the same, and of course, our wonderful, beautiful podcast listeners. Thank you for being on the show. Bud, we're continuing our radio reading roundup, um, Augustine's Confessions. Last time, we talked about Chapter 8, which is the big conversion chapter. And perhaps some people stop there, which would be unfortunate, because chapter 9, in many ways, wraps up uh, the narrative arc and about why what has been happening is important. I know last time we were talking about the confessions, but I uh, threw out a big shots fired that I thought most people misunderstood um, through the the veil of time and maybe Protestant interpretations um, of what was going on in Augustine's confessions. People make a big deal about him reading and, and sort of reading his way into the faith, but actually chapter 8 was about the stories of the saints and the, the conversions of the saints and how the saints play this huge role in helping us convert. I'd also weirdly say chapter 9 really ramps up the Catholicism angle of his, con, of his conversion, which is chapter 9 after this triumph of chapter 8 is really about death quite a bit. And if you really would just want to talk about uh, a mean way to put it, the body count. I think he talks about like five or six different people dying, most famously Monica. But I think it's interesting that he immediately makes the next chapter after his big conversion death, because of course what Augustine seems to really be saying is a conversion is a death to an old life, rebirth to another one, which in itself is a prefigurement of heaven. And I just saw this, I don't know about you, uh, as the driving force of this entire chapter. Well, recently my wife and I watched Jim Gaffigan's new comedy special. <laughs> okay. It, it's called Dark Pell, and the um, the motif of the special is it's kind of darker humor. So early in Jim Gaffigan's career, he had a special called Beyond the Pill, and it's it's playing off. He's um He's got a similar uh, heritage as you and I do, and so uh, he and his children are quite pale. And he makes jokes about, you know, how much sunblock it requires to go outside during the summer and things like this. But a, a, a kind of vibe here with Augustine as well. Um, I was surprised. So, like, the his narration of the death of Monica is, is uh, famous, and it's not surprising based on what we've looked at in the earlier chapters of the book. He kind of passes over the death of his son, and he's he's grateful to God that his son was spared, I guess, sort of like, I mean, Augustine at times sees death as, it can be a kind of blessing in the sense, like if you're right with God at the time of your passing, like you're sort of like spirit, like, so he's grateful that his son was baptized and then he dies before, you know, of course, like being possibly pulled into the various sins that Augustine faced. Well, it's interesting too, that he says, to, he, he, he makes this point about that in the faith, um, he was just as old as they were, because I guess he converts at relatively the same time. I'll be honest. I, didn't think he was very like completely specific about what happens there, but you know, he goes, he essentially goes, he died a man, right? He was this man who is now a part of the faith. Um, and it, it is interesting. It seems like Monica, he feels like he has to rope in to his story because she's so central, but other people in his life, including his dad, um, uh, his dad, uh, like you said, his son, um, the very, you know, his basically common law wife, he will be very hands off on them. And unless they kind of have to be in the story, what's interesting is in some ways he spends more time talking about the deaths of what would almost seem like random people at the very beginning. I mean, we get a lot of accounts of people who let him stay like at their houses and, uh, how long it took them to convert. And like, you know, 
dying right after they became a Christian. I'll be honest, like one of the other things that's sort of funny is you, you almost get the impression from uh, this chapter that becoming a Christian, you might die like within the next year. I mean, there's a lot of people who get sick after they become Christian. He got sick. We can talk about that. Um, but like I said, I don't think it's him being morbid and dwelling on it in a way that I think we might misunderstand it. He really does see this as this theme we've been hitting the entire time, that life is more allegorical than we realize. And then, of course, he's a rhetorician. He's a beautiful rhetorician. Um, so he picks up themes. But this theme really is that entwined in life is death, but it's almost always pointing to a rebirth if we allow that grace in our hearts to uh, leap out and be read that way, as it were. Well, we've touched on it through the earlier episodes about Augustine, but I think this is the shining example of the Catholic Augustine, Book 9. Uh, you know, like we've said that some scholars or uh, Christian pastors today will talk about Augustine as sort of like a proto-Protestant, but this chapter is just littered with a very Catholic uh, worldview and understanding of different things. He's got this fascinating story early in the chapter about um, a blind man who's healed by he's touching his, his handkerchief to relics, basically, to the bodies of holy ones or saints who have died. So you've got like um, already like a full-blown sort of Catholic understanding of relics. Um, this is I've, I've already had occasion to mention it in earlier episodes, but this is the one where St. Monica says, like, I don't care where you lay my body or what my funeral looks like, but just remember me at the altar. And then you've got a sense. So, I mean, of course, if she says, remember me at the altar, like a very sacrificial understanding of worship later in the chapter, um, Augustine goes on this um, sort of like meditative reflection from that altar. As Monica knew, the holy victim is made available to us. He through whom the record of debt that stood against us was annulled. And so this offering of the holy victim at the altar central to worship um, I don't know. It's it's a theme of the reading radio reading roundup, but uh, I can never get that one right. Uh, the Catholic Augustine Triple R. Um, you mention in passing, yes. Like so, a very Catholic moment where it's like they found hidden relics of incorruptible saints, right? Uh, and that a blind man touched a handkerchief and was uh, healed. What's interesting about this? for me, but is this is a big historical moment that sort of corroborates like a lot that's going on in Christendom. And Augustine is like throwing it into the narrative because it makes sense of what he's talking about. So this is when, is it Empress Justina? I forget which Empress it is. I should have like checked right before we went on air here. But um, one of the, the Byzantine emperors uh, and, and his wife fall into the sort of Aryan type traps and are actively putting the screws on St. Ambrose. And so you, what's interesting about this too, people like with the, if you wanted, we could dork out and lose even more listeners than, you know, maybe we've already lost. Uh, but this is an interesting note where Milan, even though it's further, further away from Eastern Christianity, like geographically, Milan has always had these weird connections with the East. And a lot of it is Ambrose. A lot of the hymns, for instance, that end up being in Western offices of prayer, or even masses um, that have an Eastern flavor come from Ambrose or ascribe to Ambrose because of Milan. And so it's interesting that the shenanigans going on with emperors and empresses that in many ways have a lot to do with the Eastern empire, uh, St. Ambrose catches trouble from them. And so this is what they're saying is, again, notice how death here and, and obscurity and seeming like you don't know where these people are end up being part of God's secret will. So what's one of the things that helps the people of, of Milan, so to speak, stand with Ambrose against uh, the political pressure that's being on him? Well, these martyrs that people had heard about but didn't know where their bar bodies were it's in a timely fashion, right, bud? Where do they find? They find them incorruptible and, you know, in procession, bring them into Milan. Uh, they, and all these miracles occur. And it sort of fortifies uh, the people behind um, Ambrose. And it doesn't convert the empress, but it makes them back off and stop pressing uh, the Aryan political issue. That's a, at least a little bit more Catholic than I remember the confessions being uh, narrated uh, in Protestant seminary. 
Yeah, and I think this is, as we're reading the Confessions, this is a book that we don't want to put within a glass case and just sort of like tip our caps to it. There's a lot here to me that pushes us. Uh, you and I uh, about, well, I lose track of time. I think it was last summer. Were we in Pittsburgh last summer? Yes. <laughs> Part of the Notre Dame course that we took. And we visited St. Anthony's Chapel, and that place is amazing. It's on a a hill overlooking downtown Pittsburgh, and it has the largest collection of relics in all of North America. I know for sure North America. And I think Rome has more. I, I don't want to put it up against Europe. I'm going to stick with the safe fact and say all of North America. <laughs> nice. But uh, it, it truly is amazing, and it's the work of a priest who... Uh, really spent the later years of his life just uh, saving relics, um, finding them in different places. You know, unfortunately, sometimes someone will get their hands on a relic and try to try to sell it for profit. But this priest just kind of traveled the world, or others knew about uh, his interest and helped helped him to collect all these relics. But it's fascinating. And again, you are trying to remember an emperor's name. I can't remember the priest's name at the like right at this moment. Father German name. He had a German name. He had a German name. <laughs> uh, he actually was a physician by training. And so before the period in his life where he really focused on collecting relics, part of his ministry as a priest was visiting visiting the sick and the dying. And uh, he would use those relics uh, as he visited the sick and the dying. So oftentimes, you know, um, people would report miracles or they would, they would ask for uh, Father German name to visit them. Uh, to provide this healing and i guess it just reminded me like there are there are a couple points one is relics just are not as visible or front-facing as they used to be in catholic devotion um, i'm grateful to have a priest at uh, father Pichu at saint augustine's who uh, when prominent free feast days comes up and we have a relic of the saint like i remember recently the feast of saint francis de sales that he'll expose the relic or present it for devotion you know but you don't see that too terribly often in Catholic churches today. But what I was moved by with this story of this priest's life in Pittsburgh, Father was, Mollinger. Well, yep, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, is that the relics were not? Uh, it wasn't. They weren't points of curiosity. Uh, he recognized the power of God's grace at work in these saints' lives, and he made that available to the people he ministered to. You see that here. That was a part of early Christian devotion as Catholics. We don't have to apologize for that. In fact, we should celebrate it. And so I would like to see more of that here in the Diocese of Des Moines. <laughs> I like how we're making Book 9 a call to arms. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so maybe even an arm bone. Like, that's how relics work, people. Uh, so, Bud, that one is very uh, evident, like I said in this, like how death um, points beyond itself, which, again, Catholics always get um, stereotyped as being morbid. Uh, but I think that that's to your point about the way the relics of the saints are a very Augustinian nexus, as it were, of the grace of God touching earth. And so that's why this veneration of saints and saints' graves, um, again, very odd uh, if you consider a, a certain idea, uh, a truncation of Augustine, I would say, that I'm very familiar with before I converted um, you seem to never hear this aspect of Augustine, even though it's just threaded through in the confessions. But another one that I think, Bud, that, that people somehow forget. You know how I've said before that people for, you know, they act like Thomas Aquinas is the dorky philosopher guy, but actually what he's probably most well known for, even if people don't ascribe it to him, is a poet because he wrote the entire Feast of Corpus Christi. So the most the faithful have actually heard Thomas Aquinas' words have actually been liturgical praise. In a similar way, Augustine gets seen as, again, a big philosophy dork guy or a big political guy. So we hear a lot of, of Augustine's politics. Um, but here in Book 9, what he says really made him understand the faith is he became a man of the Psalms. And so he, he, he actually explicates an entire psalm. He talks about Psalm 4, um, and he kind of gives a mini exegesis of Psalm 4 and how he thinks it um, wraps up and sums up what's going on in his life as a convert um, and thinks that that's what he would want to preach to the former Manichees at the time. Actually, it's even interesting more than that. He says beyond preaching Psalm 4, he wishes he could just let the Manichaeans come see him unaware singing Psalm 4, and he thinks that that would be more of a, a goad to help them convert 
and uh, <laughs> rather than if he went and actually argued with him, a very interesting um, idea in itself. But the whole book opens up with his sort of um, paraphrase of Psalm 116. Uh, he starts with, and he, and you start to realize he's done this multiple times throughout the book, where he starts with a psalm, and then it sort of is his jumping board um, under rest of what he's going to say. So, O oh Lord, I'm your servant. I'm your servant servant and your handmaid son you burst my bonds asunder and to you will i offer a sacrifice of praise may my heart and tongue give you give praise to you and all my bones cry out their question who is like you O lord let them ask and then do you respond and say to my soul i am your salvation so that's psalm 116 but then he goes but who am i what am i is there any evil i have not committed in deeds then he he talks about that look you're you uh drained the cesspool of corruption in my heart so that I ceased to will all that I had been wont to will, and now willed what you willed. So his idea is praise, particularly um, praying the Psalms, is what he saw as um, the new seed of, of, of his baptismal life as a Christian, planted you know, in this new soil. It was the Psalms that watered him uh, into the full fruition that he was looking for, once more, I don't think Augustine gets um, often pointed to as the big Psalms guy. Of course, Benedict, uh, you know, the Benedictines, the monks. But of course, Augustine has makes a rule of life. And as you can already see, but here early in his life, he's proto-monastic until he's sort of eventually, you know, made into bishop and all these things like this. Um, but once more, St. Augustine, like the, the martyrs and the saints play this, um, and their relics play a very integral role to his confession, uh, con- uh, conversion, but particularly the Psalms in making him become what he sees as uh, a full-fledged Christian after this initial conversion. Well, and that Psalm leads into a discussion of freedom. I think, yeah, we, we got into this last week, but that's just really at the heart of Augustine's understanding of his conversion to the Christian faith. And I love this passage, the, the start of Book 9, because he he's done such a great job earlier in the book of describing how it was it was his attachment to vice that ultimately made it difficult to come into the faith. So uh, you see you see different complexions to people's conversions. In some cases, they have a strong like moral conversion. What I mean by that is like someone is convicted by the depth of their sins and they turn to God, and then they grow in understanding of the faith. Augustine's an interesting case where like mentally or intellectually he arrived at a place and he recognized the truth of Christianity, but he, you know, like last week we talked about the famous prayer, uh, Oh Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. But he says like, once I let those things go, like the thing that I was so loath to give away, all of a sudden I found this freedom. And this is, this is so hard to sometimes to convey to young people. You know, um, I, I'm at the point as a father where, like uh, my kids are entering their adolescence and I sort of, I'm Rachel and I are spoiled because our first daughter is like, she's been, well, she was uh, a really strong willed toddler, but has been like a very like sort of, uh, I don't want to jinx it on air. No, <laughs> she's a very respectful, like obedient, like dutiful teenager. But like when you're talking to young people, like I, I think of the college or like when I've um, done catechesis for middle schoolers and things like that, uh, it's hard to convey, but like the the uh, the the pleasures or the enticements of the world, they're so enticing. And you know, uh, like we we automatically turn to sins of the flesh. But even things like success, entertainment, wealth, like when, <laughs> I'm at the point where I realize, like you know, my days are fading. You know, like I I sort of uh, uh, I've chosen a track in life, and it's kind of like settled in a certain manner. Um, but like when you're, when you're young and in your teens and in your twenties, like the world seems in front of you. And so you want to like, what, what do we say? Like, um, grab the bull by the horns or, right. you know, squeeze the juice out of life. <clears throat> but Augustine realizes like he, he became attached to these things and it wasn't a freedom to him. It was like, it was, it was bondage as the Psalms talks about. And the more he sought that, like the more like, uh, entrenched or curved against itself, his soul became, uh, my, my my children, we were um, playing out in the country like recently. We were at some friend's house, and when we came home, they experienced the joy of Midwestern summer chiggers, mm-hmm. <laughs> like the kind of like mosquito type 
and, um, bugs, but the ones who like dig under your skin and, and stay there. And I remember with chigger bites, like what really like was just hard as a kid is like the more you scratched it, the, the more they it itched. Yep. yep. It just worsened and worsened. And Augustine was like, I kept scratching that itch and there was nothing that would satisfy Rolling Stones. <laughs> but when, when I was able to finally let it go, like he's like, it's almost like flabbergasting him. Like, how could I cling to that? And sort of like keep at bay the the depths of the riches of God's grace, mercy, and joy. Yeah, and ab- and towards this right, it's actually the vanity of his career that sort of stings at the very last. And we'll talk about that when we get back from the break. This is the uncommon good. Bob Bonner, Doctor Bud Mars, stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show, whether that be on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network over the air, whether it's iowacatholicradio.com where you can listen live, Iowa Catholic Radio app, or our good listeners on the podcast. We are doing our radio reading roundup, book nine, St. Augustine's Confessions, book nine, doing fine, bud. Uh, still so much to um, delve into uh, from all of this going on. So, I think with this segment, we can start talking about Augustine lays out what immediately happens after he converts. Um, And, I mean, this goes from everything from what he decides to do with his career uh, to his mom's funeral. Um, Also, little tidbits like he goes and asks Ambrose, by the way, I mean, this is almost apropos to nothing, but it's I think it's an experience most people um, have felt before where they felt um, excited about something and they go to someone that they know knows a lot. So... Augustine goes to Ambrose and he goes, which book of the Bible should I read first? And Ambrose goes, the book of Isaiah. And then Augustine admits, I started it and I really didn't get it. So I waited to to read it a lot later. (laughs) And I mean, this is a philosopher guy. I love that he was all like, "Uh, not for me, not at this time. And if I'm not mistaken, right, he eventually writes a commentary on Isaiah, right? I'm pretty sure he does. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, but I just think it's funny that at the time he's like, was fired up. Ambrose is like, go read Isaiah. And he starts and he's like, eh, maybe later, Ambrose. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a total bunny trail. But like when you think about the Bible, like uh, the, the members of the body of Christ, like we're so diverse and in personality and outlook and things like that. And one thing with the Bible is like there are times where those with my personality and outlook were like, why didn't God just make it simpler? Like, couldn't it just be a series of like 120 propositions where it's like, do this, don't do that. And then you realize like the heart of the message is that the word of God became incarnate and the old Testament sets up all of that. You know, like it's this deep mystery with all sorts of complexion, complexions and textures. But I see this with introducing new Christians to the Bible where there are parts of the Bible that really resonate with me. So I'm like a huge, like gospel of John guy. Uh, I love Hebrews. Like Hebrews was crucial in my conversion to the Catholic faith. But there are those, like, when, when I meet a new disciple, I'm always like, oh, like, steer him away from Leviticus at first, or, you know, like, Isaiah's heavy sledding. Uh, they might read Ecclesiastes wrong or, like, draw the wrong conclusion. But you find folks who are like, Leviticus, like, this is awesome. Right. Like, all these legal codes. And, I'm you know, a numbers like, convert. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so it's cool to hear this from Augustine, like you said. You'd think, like, someone with Augustine's, like, towering intellect, like, he would just read any part of the Bible and be like, this is awesome. Here's the meaning. Write a book about it. But it took him time to warm up to Isaiah. No, I mean, exactly. And I, yeah, I, when I started taking the faith seriously growing up, it was Job, right? And, you know, no one is supposed to like Job. And I was like, Job's great. I love Job. Um, and to your point, here's Augustine admitting um, that, he, you know, at this point, he, he, he intellectually converted, like you said. Um, we know he reads like Neoplatonism. He's already down with the allegorical reading of the Old Testament. And he's still like, I like when Paul just tells people to stop doing bad things. <laughs> that, that was where he was at um, in the spiritual life. So like you said, um, I think very consoling that even if Augustine um, had to wait for the right proper time for him to read Isaiah and it really sink into his heart. You're okay, listener, if you happen to be reading a book of the Bible and you're like, it's just not hitting me yet. It can do the so in the future. Um, but this idea of timeliness and what you need to do in response to the gospel, uh, in response to conversion, in responsible to making um, Jesus Christ the center of your life, this is what the first part of the book of book nine is about. Augustine decides 
he needs to get out of prostituting uh, the words of his mouth, is what he says, and turn it to the praise of God. Um, one more time where I think in some ways younger Augustine who converts is sort of running as fast as he can against the allurement of something that later he obviously shows that he appreciates. We, we talked about this in the last segment. You can't write an intro to book nine or basically any of the hymns of praise that Augustine writes in this book unless you are a just superb rhetorician. I mean, he is a wordsmith. But at the time, he rightly denotes, like you, you were saying in the last segment, but that the biggest hindrance for him had long stopped being intellectual ones, and it was the allurements of like the thousand paper cuts of the world. And one of those for him was his job. And his job, he goes, I put so much into it because that's where I got this sense of like honor and importance. And he goes, I knew that I had to cut that out uh, of my life and uh, make a radical turn so that I could actually fully embrace what was going on. He decides, uh, going on with his conversion, he decides that he's not going to quit. Essentially, it sounds like he had like a month left of school. And he thought that if he quit, then it looked like he was just being self-aggrandizing. So he's like, he'll finish out the semester. And then I love this part, but because he starts getting into the minutia of like, look, I'm going to have a lot of parents. They're going to be met. Blah, blah. And he goes, lucky for me, my voice was failing. And it sounds like he had tuberculosis or something, man. Like, But he goes, look at you being nice to me, God, that like, even if I wanted to continue, I wouldn't have been able to. Uh, but for him... It's interesting that this, I, I think this is, we always think Augustine and his problem is the lust stuff. And clearly it's something he struggled with a long time. But for him, I think the lust of worldly recognition was almost just as important. And I don't know, bud, we weren't there. We can't be inside of, of Augustine's head. Yeah. So when he goes, oh, I should finish out the semester you know, maybe he's making an excuse to, to, to make things easier. But I really think the way he talks about it is because I got into this teaching stuff for the worldly acclaim, if I make a big deal quitting when there's just like a few, I think he said 20 days left to teach, that would be about me self-aggrandizing as well. So I'm just going to let this slowly fade away and then have this excuse of like having lung issues to not take up another semester of students and then that w will be the way that I let this part of me that, that was so much of holding me back from Jesus um, die a noble death. Well, and you've already touched on this a, a tad, but as you speak about that, what strikes me about the saints is you look at someone like Thomas Aquinas or Augustine, and those really are, you know, there, there, are, there are intellects that maybe compete with those at some level but when you talk about the two greatest thinkers and writers in the western catholic tradition it really is augustine and aquinas and in both cases like you you when you dive into their works you just expect it to be like one big you know it's and, and there is there's so much depth here so it's just like you expect them to celebrate the intellect at every turn and uh, they they're not they're not shy about like doing the uh, triple backflip or whatever, but in both cases, like you can see the depth of their spirituality. So you mentioned Saint Thomas Aquinas writing, you know, amazing Eucharistic poetry. Uh, he, of course, near the end of his life, has a mystical experience at the altar where he says, like everything that I've written before now, I consider as straw in comparison to what I just experienced while celebrating Mass. Here with Augustine. Uh, you know, like the mystical experiences there. He has the shared mystical experience with St. Monica. He's, his poetry is amazing, but I think it's all rooted in his internalization of the Psalms. And so there's a section in book, book nine that's called, he lives with the Psalms. And I thought, oh, you know, like that's kind of convicting or challenging. Like Augustine, he was just immersed in the Psalms. And I think this framed his entire, like sort of like faith outlook worldview and, and he just integrates this and weaves this into every section of his writings. Um, I think that w when he narrates that experience with St. Monica, that's fascinating because like uh, there are spiritual writers who they say like, don't sell yourself short Catholics. Like sometimes we think that contemplation is reserved for monks or for saints. 
So there's kind of like there's rote prayer. There's prayers that we memorize verbally. Uh, there's the the communal prayer of the church, and then different Catholics practice like Lexio Divina, where you pray the words of Scripture, or you know, like for for many um, for many disciples, like the 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 Rosary is very popular. But the saints and the and and monks and others push us towards contemplation, where we have a direct experience with God. It takes time to build up to it, and sometimes we think like, well, that's kind of reserved for like the A team or whatnot. Um, I think in reading Augustine, we're reminded like we should all seek that kind of union with God that's available through contemplation. What's fascinating with what he writes about here is like normally that's kind of um, an individual experience. It's something that we experience in personal prayer. But in this case, he and Monica have this kind of like mystical flight together. Well, and to to address this, many of the, his sort of striking out in prayer where it really matters to him, and, he, and Book 9, like I said, multiple times where he talks about the efficacy of prayer. So on the hand, even when it's for, um, before we get to the mystical experience, so he talks, you know, he's talking about this chastisement, like, oh, God has made good, my my lungs are crappy so that I don't have to, it's a good pretense to not keep going. But then he's like, you also had a chastisement for me that was immediately um, an opportunity for grace when he has this horrible toothache and he asks everyone to pray for him and everyone prays for him. The toothache goes away and he's like, I'd never experienced that again. One more time where this is Augustine towering intellect. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't believe when I asked these people to pray for me that God answered the prayer. So, but like you said, communal, right? So it wasn't just, so a lot of this book, the confessions, right? Is him personally talking to God you get some people who act like the Book of the Confessions invented the modern individual. I think that goes too far. But you, but to your point, here he is saying, oh, yeah, I had a need, and when I turned it over to a communal prayer, it was efficacious, and that was extremely important um, element in the story of my full conversion. Now to your next point, he and Monica are talking about the saints, and then, of course, thematically, this makes a lot of sense in this book, but we've already talked about how death is rebirth and is suffused through chapter nine. It's going to make a big deal, right? He talks about this right before Monica dies, but they're talking about the saints in heaven and what it must be like to enjoy heaven because it has to be better than any bodily experience that we have now. And then it's like you said, they don't have um, a method. He wasn't like, then we went into step four in the mental prayer, you know, He's not talking about ladders yet. He he doesn't even bring up metaphor. There's just this way in which their natural talk and, like you said, communal contemplation, meditation that goes into contemplation, it's very natural that as they raise their minds and hearts to what they're considering, they themselves can't help but be wrapped up in uh, what goes on. And so it's, he, you know, her, Monica and, and Augustine are talking about the saints in heaven and what it must be like. And then he has this wonderful meditation where he brings in the, the, that wisdom is eternal, right? And that she has no beginning or end. This is, of course, like the book of wisdom that he's referring to. And then finally, he talks about something that I know is a dead horse I love beating, but it's important that silence is the final medium that is unmediated and speaks the loudest, even though, of course, no sound is heard. And to your point... That seems like this has to be this ascetical individual struggle up the mountain of contemplation, but it's actually together with his mom that because they set their mind together on this fervent desire to imagine what the saints must enjoy in heaven with God, that they eventually attain silence and in silence, um, silence speaks to the depths of their heart. And that is what Christian mysticism truly is, right? Is that in silence, we don't have to say anything or even hear anything because God has, so to speak, embraced us in his being. He, and this is in this book also, he says God is being itself yeah. um, as a throwaway line. But you're right. I, I think it's very important to say he does this through a natural conversation with someone else. It doesn't have to be spiritual mathletes. Notice too, right, that this is Augustine at the beginning of being a Christian. Like he, he hasn't gone through all of these years of being a bishop or the controversies. In some way, it's his innocent uh, fervor that he has with his mother that allows him to have this mystical insight. Well, this is a good corrective, I think, to uh, some, some sort of like ideas about spirituality that are becoming more popular. 
inevitably in our culture, you see like there are ideas, ideas that Catholics have been about for a long time, like confessing our sins or, you know, this sort of like type of prayer. And inevitably our culture comes around and says like, you know what? Like it's usually like bastardized, but you know, like divulging your soul to someone that can be really healing. Or uh, in the case of meditation, like you're starting to see even like in corporate America, these sort of movements to say like, well, we've got to create time periods for employees to experience silence. And uh, even some, I think like sort of like popular Catholic speakers can kind of like pick up on these threads and talk about like that the health benefits of meditation, you know, usually well-intentioned. But when I say corrective, what I have in mind is like Augustine reminds us that Christian meditation is always about encounter with the living God. So he says, like, as he has this poem after talking about his experience with with Monica, he says that, like, we we reach this place and touch that eternal wisdom who abides above all things. And so it's not like, um, it's not a search to sort of, like, negate our personality or to eliminate all desire. It's always about encounter. And that's where with Augustine, like, with a lot of what we're talking about on today's show, like, his, his spirituality and his theology is so balanced. Like you've got, you've got contemplation and you've got like great intellectual rhetorical reverie for lack of a better term, but also like a real simplicity about the faith and a sense of what's foundational and also like a brass tacks kind of like, look, if you're attached to this particular uh, sin of pride or lust or whatever it happens to be, you actually have to let go of that to experience the fullness of the freedom that God provides like you mentioned silence you, you know he's 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 a great like theologian of silence but also talks about the role of the psalms and of singing hymns in the spiritual life i love that part when he touches on the hymns where uh, you get the sense so the one of the characteristics of the roman rite is that it's always had like this beautiful simplicity it's sort of unadorned in the sense like if you've experienced the divine liturgy in the east uh, it's very uh, melodic and textured. And, you know, like it's kind of like sometimes like you'll be heading one way in the, in the Eucharistic celebration and kind of circles back. Um, you know, the, the Roman rite is textured for sure, but it also has this kind of like brass tacks. The priest approaches the altar, you know, he's got a work to do to offer the Opus Dei and does so. And, um, in a lot of places, like, um, even today, like sometimes without without chant or song or hymns accompanied. And you hear this from Augustine where he says, like, we sort of picked up this tradition of the East. And it's funny to me where he says, like, hymns started to be, to be added so people wouldn't faint from weariness, you know. So right. it's kind of like the, the hymns and the songs carried them along. Now we've got this great, you know, treasure of sacred music in the West. But I, I really like that sort of historical tidbit at that part of Book Nine. Well, and even the historical tidbit part. So this is where he first brings up memory. And, of course, we're going to get tons of memory in the coming books. But he brings up, because this is after he says, like, oh, yeah, and I remember this whole episode with the Aryan persecution of Ambrose and how they come out of it. And he says, isn't that strange that my memory made me think of that right now while I was writing this this chapter 9? And so his memory, he goes, like, it's to your to your balanced approach about Augustine. So yes, mystical contemplation and don't think about the things of earth, right? And the things below are not, you know, are, are nothing compared to the glories of heaven. But then memory, right, which is this very human thing that remembers the things of this world, which gets into this whole allegory thing that I've been hitting on. Memory is sort of the way that God uses the past to point to eternity. And so he does it. So now he's doing this with his mom. He's going to talk about his mom dies and then he goes and gives basically like the best eulogy to a mom uh, you could ever have. It's like we're all going to fail our moms, bud, compared to like how great Augustine did this. But man, it runs the gamut about <laughs> Monica. One of my favorite like side notes is when he's all like, I, I, "This is advice you shouldn't follow." But he was like, "Yeah, the reason that my mom had a lot of self control is that they gave them no water except at dinner time." And uh, you might sound, think that's crazy, but I can give you reports from the 1990s when we would be at football practice in 100-degree weather, and they're like, well, you can only drink at water break because you need to learn to play without being hydrated. Of course, now they're like, drink at all times because water's so important. So shout out to my memory remembering uh, 1990 football practice while reading the confessions. Um, but, you know, he brings up what seems like Monica's stealing the peaches moment which is hilarious because it's, you know, he, she, she basically is like, 
licking the, the the spoon you get the wine with. I mean, it's very little, and it's hilarious because you go, oh, so Monica must have struggled with alcoholism like three decades. No, this actually went on for like a few weeks. Um, but this to me, bud, I know this seems like a r- weird way to draw up, th- you know, this episode. But what he starts to point out is, so vi- what makes her stop is one of her servants like uh, says, hey, if you <clears throat> don't do this, that, or the other, I'm going to I'm gonna tell that you've been drinking this wine. And he goes, the wickedness of people's intentions, which was just to like, the servant was trying to get one up on her master, uh, master's child, that that converter, she goes, you're right. Like, I shouldn't do this. This is beneath what I've been asked to do. And our flatterers can actually make us go astray but even the people who are after us, God's will can make into something like what became St. Monica, the peacemaker who converted a pagan husband, brought back a wayward son, and in her death even let go of the, the wanting to be buried in her homeland because her homeland was heaven. Um, God's will is sovereign, but not in this sort of tyrannical way but in the beautiful way of an artist. And I think that's what Augustine ultimately tries to do with his book nine. This is The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars, stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Mar joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. It's wonderful to have you with us. Be it on air on iowacatholicradio.com or the Iowa Catholic Radio app, or if it happens to be our podcast listeners, thank you for listening to the show. But um, I'll be honest, most people wrap up their reading of the confessions with book nine, yeah. which makes enough sense. We are not. We're going to okay. we're going to keep heading on, keep heading forth. I do think we have a break next week, so if you hear a rerun, um, don't get don't sweat it. We're going to keep trucking on in Augustine. But as I've been saying every time, bud. So happy that we decided to do this because the Confessions has come alive in ways that it simply hasn't before. Uh, and uh, so, yes, I, I think past you and me, we're brilliant for making this decision. <laughs> well, it's a joy to be conveying some St. Augustine over the airwaves and by podcast. You know, I this is it, it feels like every time on the show that I invent a marketing theme it's usually a bad idea (laughs) but what do you think about this one Uh so you mentioned the podcast and the folks can listen using the iowa catholic radio app like uh we have we have listeners take a photo of their favorite way of listening to the uncommon good i know my friend matt in kansas he says he likes to listen as he mows the lawn oh wow uh so like it, it could be like uh matt mowing the lawn and listening to the show or like another matt in iowa like on the treadmill maybe and it could be hashtag UCG. Hashtag. Are you saying only Matt can do this? Or as, are we? Do we have a very specific audience of people named after uh, the first gospel? Writer? We come up with this amazing idea, and it's just like my kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's like those pictures where they look like they're hostages, and it's like, no. <laughs> no, just like uh, I, I feel like today the young people, they listen to their – their radio offerings primarily by podcast, but I, I feel like that'd be a fun one. Yeah. So do they just send this to uh, Iowa Catholic radio somehow? Yeah, they would. Well, they would post it on the social medias and hashtag things. Like okay. Hashtag UCG, hashtag treadmill, hashtag Iowa state fair. Right, do you have Twitter where you can look up the hashtag UCG to see if they're doing this? <laughs> I'll be the Twitter police. Although it's not Twitter anymore. It's X. X. I, Oh, geez. <laughs> That's a whole other hour podcast to talk about that. You, you can pray the rosary using the Iowa Catholic there Radio app go. or join us on air, so to speak. So we broadcast the rosary at 6 a.m. At 10 a.m., the Chapel of Divine Mercy at 10 or the Chapel of Divine Mercy at 2.55 in the afternoon. And again, use the rosary to listen to the Uncommon Good while you run on the treadmill, mow your lawn, or pray the rosary uh, as you take your evening walk. Absolutely. Great ways to do that. And also, I mean, look, the things that are coming up now, bud, is it's August. We know what that means here in Iowa. Iowa Catholic Radio uh, at the Iowa Prepare Catholic your arteries. Fair. <laughs> Iowa Catholic Fair. Which, uh, Iowa State, State Fair, Fair. Excuse me. <laughs> um, we'll be there like we have been, uh, having uh, the tables. Um, hopefully you get to all see uh, various radio hosts uh, and people that work at Iowa Catholic Radio. Um, so be lo- on the lookout for us there. Uh, the first thing coming up for that August 10th, uh, Des Moines, at, uh, 
of course, at the Iowa State Fair, 8 p.m. for King and Country with special guest We the Kingdom. And another one on the 20th at 8 p.m., Iowa State Fair, Kane. Um, this dinner in December is, uh, of course, coming up, and we have everything like that. You can go check on the events at iowacatholicradio.com. That's also where you can donate online, iowacatholicradio.com, or 515-223-1150. Please remember that this uh, is uh, a ministry that doesn't happen except that you Make it happen with your prayers, um, but yes, your donation as well. We'd love to see you at the State Fair, talk about all that we're up to, um, and then coming up in September, we're going to have um, a, a fall uh, fundraiser, but if you can keep us in your prayers yeah. and in your monthly donations, that is a way to keep this happening, keep the, it keeping The fall on. fundraiser is easy to remember this year because it starts on my birthday, September 25th. Oh, so if you want to make a great gift to Catholic ministry here in Iowa, but also a symbolic birthday present to your favorite <laughs> co-host, <laughs> September 25th, fall fundraiser. Absolutely. Well, bud, thanks for uh, making another wonderful radio reading roundup. Uh, we're looking forward to plowing through the rest of Augustine here soon. This is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our family, city, state, nation, uh, Solar System, Galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.